a lot of AI, but AI is interesting, so I can't deny the fact that people are just wanting to, you know, listen about it and hear about it more. So AI has been in existence for decades, maybe like, you know, good 67 years, uh, 60, 70 years, right? But this chat GPT sensation just rattled the world, right? And I remember in 2012, uh, well, December, you know, when it was just launched, chat GPT was all people spoke about for the next six, six months, right? And as we have seen a lot of startups create their own GPT versions, right? For multiple purposes and all, right? But one thing I absolutely love about AI now is that people are seeing how AI is impacting their real day-to-day -day life, right? So that is pretty interesting to see. So without any further ado, I'll just ask my speakers to briefly introduce about themselves and what AI means for your businesses. So sir, you first. Hi, thanks for having me here. I am Siddharth, I'm co-founder of Bharat Agri. Bharat Agri is a B2C e-commerce company for farmers, where farmers can buy all kinds of seeds, fertilizers, pesticides from the platform, and we deliver to their doorstep in three to four days. Um, we are an advisory-driven e-commerce, where farmers first come with their queries about uh, what they should grow, how they should grow it, what kind of fertilizers or pesticides they should use. Our system um, recommends them what they should use, and then they can place them. And what AI, uh, what impact has AI had on Bharat Agri? Uh, multiple ways. Fortunately, uh, we have a couple of people on a cap table uh, who literally forced us to build something in AI in early 2023 uh, when ChatGPT just got famous. So we have used AI in two ways. The first is um, once a user places an order on the platform, uh, since, since these are rural users, they have almost never used Flipkart or Amazon. Uh, so this is their first online order. They get very anxious. Where is my order? I have made the payment. Or uh, they will start asking about, okay, my seed is delivered. How do I use this seed? And we invested heavily on customer support where there were humans who were answering these queries. Fortunately, we started building a model where a lot of these queries are now answered by AI. Uh, we have divided it into three parts. The first part is saving cost. Naturally, where if AI answers some bunch of our questions, we save money uh, in the team. The second is advisory. We have to answer questions about their crop problems. They are growing a crop, they don't know what to do, and generally these answers are given by an agri doctor. And now, stage two for us is where AI is able to answer some of these questions. Uh, I would really welcome you to try it. Go to Bharat Agri website or app. Uh, maybe ask some questions that my tomato is yellow and I don't and the, the bot or the AI tool will suggest you what you should do. That's stage two. And stage three is where we recommend them the products and help them in ordering those products. That is where we have not yet reached. So that is something that's still under development, uh, where we want our system to uh, recommend the products and also help them in placing the order. So that's something that we are trying to build right now. Great. Thank you, sir. Your turn. Hi, my name. My name is Anshuman. Uh, I'm founder of a company called Scalar, which is uh, which is trying to be this uh, new age educational institute for higher education in tech. I mean, in India, everybody wants to become an engineer or a doctor. And uh, unfortunately, in spite of that, we believe that the state of education in engineering is kind of broken. Um, so just for the field of tech, which is computer science, AI, ML, if we believe um, we could be the source of a great source of talent, and I mean, Scalar as a company tries to nurture that talent. If people aspire to go and work for the likes of uh, Google, Facebook, etc., then Scalar is sort of that stepping stone for them. So we currently run two different kind of programs. One is uh, online uh, for people who have already graduated, so it's a year-long rigorous program completely done online without having to leave a job. Uh, and the second program is uh, if uh, you just completed your class 12 then instead of going to a regular college, you come to us for four years, and then that's where you complete your graduation, uh, graduate with a bachelor's degree, as well as probably better than others. We just have that last year, so we'll figure out how the talent was as compared to us. Great, thank you. As for AI, um, I mean, look, I, prior to Scala, I've been an engineer myself. I, was, I used to work with Facebook. I led the team that built Facebook Messenger. Um, and I always felt that AI was not at the stage where you could leverage just to do something meaningful. You could probably just uh, hardcode your logic and that would perform better. Post the 
these LLM models and ChatGPT, uh, there are now certain kinds of profit statements which can, which probably AI can solve uh, as good as that. So as of today, uh, we've actually replaced a lot of our teaching assistants who would help students in their uh, doubts when they are solving problems uh, with AI. So we don't completely replace it. I mean humans with AI, but just the fact that now a TA is able to do a lot more, because now I can be assisting five different people at the same time, just because AI is doing 80% more. Uh, very similarly, like, um, things around like what kind of problems to suggest as you're learning, if you're weaker in, in, in your learning path, so then customizing the learning path, that is again like one other case where we leverage AI. Great, thank you, Blue. you? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Abhiru. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Velocity. Uh, we started Velocity three and a half years back uh, to uh, extend financing to new age brands, new age businesses. I was a VC in my previous life and I felt that a lot of companies, even though they have good cash flows, uh, they have difficulty in raising equity uh, So we try to reach that cash flow financing products that we offer. Uh, as per AI, I think, uh, we at Velocity at least have taken a goal that in 2024 we need to transform ourselves into an AI first company. And for that what we have done is that uh, we have a central task force across multiple things that we do as a company. Uh, that team is like looking at use cases, uh, building uh, solutions, building applications internally uh, to address those use cases. Uh, we talk about a few of them, it can range from content creation, we are creating content uh, which is the first version of the content typically gets created by the AI uh, and then uh, it would be a person who would sort of proofread it, ensure that the quality control is in place. Uh, but I think that theme is something that we are seeing across the board that even in terms of the way tech development happens, a lot of coding can be done uh, by AI uh, but then you would have a developer who would sort of be leveraging that to ensure that it is all pieced together nicely uh, and overall there are no mistakes there. Uh, so we see a big role that AI is going to play in not replacing humans. Uh, but significantly improving the productivity of humans across across multiple areas that we do, including customer service and sales also. So uh, we are building multiple applications which will uh, be like pretty impactful in driving productivity improvement uh, at our end. Great, thank you. And I feel that one of the most interesting benefits AI provides is the personalization, customization, you know, the competency of it. So in your, you know, specific industries, what role does it play and what do you think are the hidden gems or the hidden gaps which, you know, potential startups or you in fact, if you wish to expand, can, you know, fulfill. So yeah, I will start with you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was basically attending a conference from Jeff Dean, who is one of the um, Google chief scientists. He said like, there are two major breakthroughs that are going to happen through AI in the next five years. One is in the field of education and the other is in the field of healthcare. Uh, in education, he specifically mentioned that, look, I mean, if you look at the kind of education that aristocrats used to have uh, in early times, was that a, a king would make sure that their sons or daughters have a personal coach all throughout their journey. Uh, however, that does not scale to the regular masses. Uh, one thing that AI can do right now, and again, like I'm with him on that, like AI cannot replace human beings, but one thing which which AI could do is that it, over a period of time, could evolve to become this personal coach, initially assisted through human beings. However, like in the long run, it could probably become autonomous. And the reason why that's a big, big business opportunity in the education space is because once you have that model which you possess, it's an extremely sticky model. If an AI model knows more about me and how I learn, what are the choices that I should do based on who I am, then I mean I have no incentive to move to a different place because that other place would not know nothing about me and I have to build the entire model again. Uh, so hence I mean one of his hypothesis was that look the next trillion dollar companies are going to come from these places that can own this data and can create these hyper personalized models on how people learn or how people uh, take care of their well-being. Education being one of those industries. So I, I do believe like AI is extremely exciting for education and there's, there's a lot that will happen in the next five you will be doing? At least on the personalization front, uh, that is at the heart of what we do, right? Because we started with the belief that no two businesses are similar. 
the cash flow of an e-commerce business, for example, would be uh, peaking out during the festive season. Uh, but a SaaS company typically would have more recurring cash flows, more stable, right? And uh, the reason why we started Velocity was because we felt that a one-size-fits-all approach does not really work in financial services. Uh, but that is what was happening uh, externally. Everyone would just provide a business term loan, which is like an 18-month term loan with a fixed GMI repayment. Uh, and we felt that uh, there is a lot of potential in building uh, financing products which are in line with their requirements, in line with their business cash flows. Uh, and the way we see AI playing a significant role in that is that, as of now still, that internally we have some frameworks in terms of how we bridge that gap, how we uh, internally figure out and recommend the right product structure to them. Uh, but a lot of that initial triaging can happen uh, based upon an AI agent. Uh, we are building voice agents which will have the initial conversation, which will be, as an example, building upon the bank statements of a business. Understand the cash flows. Uh, and also talk to the customer a little bit to understand their requirement, but then propose a product which is really in line with their uh, business requirements and in line with their cash flows. Uh, and that we believe will take the personalization to the next level. It will definitely have a big impact on improving customer satisfaction. Uh, they would have a product which meets their requirement much better. Uh, and we believe that a lot of financing uh, products should eventually move to something like that, uh, where we are not really trying to think product first and then trying to fit that on the customer need. Uh, but we are really able to uh, build products in real time which are suited towards their requirements. Great. You I think uh, personalization is a very interesting aspect uh, behind AI. And uh, I'll just explain this by an example about how we are using it. So let's say there are two different farmers. One of them is growing onion and another is growing garlic. And uh, we know that both of them need the same pesticide. If I just tell them that this pesticide is applicable to both the crops, they will maybe not buy it. But if I tell them that this pesticide is specifically needed for onion, specifically for this disease, then they have high chances of buying it because now it is personalized for them. Uh, interestingly, AI is helping us do it. Uh, right now, we are able to create images in the catalogs based on what the farm is growing. And when the farmer sees an image, when the farmer initially tells us that he's growing onion, and then the entire app has images about what pesticides are needed for onion, they have high probability of buying it. We are looking forward to a stage where we will also be able to generate videos that are personalized for the user. Right now, we have reached a stage where text and images can be developed and can be shown to them. Maybe in next three to six months, we'll reach a stage where even videos will be generated automatically based on the input that the user has given to us. That would be really next level where the farmer will feel or the user will feel that this video is specifically for me. It's like a doctor speaking to you. Then the probability of the farmer buying that particular product is very high. And that's possible only because of AI, because we can't build, we can't create hundreds of videos every week. Human. Great, great. Uh, so, uh, it's that this question will be for you is that, you know, considering the fact that the global agriculture, yeah, the global agriculture market is, you know, it was supposed to be around 1.7 uh, million USD dollars in 2023, and it's about to obviously grow, like, you know, spend this day. What all, what would be your one, uh, you know, like, just a piece of advice for potential agri tech startup funds? I think in this particular field, the biggest advice that I would like to give may not be related to AI, but would be that uh, staying with the customers for a long duration of time, interacting with them as much as possible really helps in the early stage. One difference between Agritech and any other segment is, if I am in Bangalore and let's hypothetically assume I am building an e-commerce or a quick commerce uh, business, I can interact with five customers within 100 meters of my house and I can do customer surveys and I can try to see if what I'm doing is right or not. But that fails when you're building an agritech startup where you have to maybe shift yourself to a village. But just going to the village over weekends will not help, which a lot of people do when before starting the company. You have to shift there, uh, live with them for at least 6 to 12 months and learn from them. That would be my advice. Great, great. And Anshuman, this will be for you. Uh, you know, considering the fact that in today's time, IT cool, obviously, India is known for it. And there's just this constant upskilling and reskilling which is required, right? So, 
so what on a scale of 1 to 10 10 being the most mature what ai pool in india id pool do you rate right now people are going to beat me for it <laughs> but but our quality of talent actually so india is uh, two parts there is a mass india and there is this niche top 0.1% india uh, the niche top 0.1% India is absolutely AI ready. Reason is that AI is actually built on fundamentals of computer science. If you're really, really strong on fundamentals of computer science, then it becomes easier for you to then also become an AI engineer. If you look at the talent pool, for example, in OpenAI or Facebook AI Labs or Google AI Labs, none of them have done any course or an educational program which is around AI. It's just been proper CS engineers who had extremely solid fundamentals and hence were able to learn everything would make sense. Then there's this mass pool of um, India, which unfortunately associates themselves with tools. If you go and ask a random person, they'll say, I'm a Java engineer, I'm a Python engineer, which is absurd. No, no mechanics says I'm a screwdriver mechanic. Um, and because of that, because they stick to that portion, they don't, I mean, their minds aren't actually designed to look at patterns and then like understand AI as much and hence your mass India is actually not ready for, for building models as a today. Uh, there is a big gap that still needs to be filled up. That's probably why we exist. Is this score you are giving? Point one percent probably nine out of ten. Uh, the other ninety nine point nine two to three out of ten. Great. Uh, you know Abhirup this will be to you. Um, you know in today like there's this just this you know like a boom of AI startups, right? And Abhi everybody is interested in AI. Let's go start an AI startup and all this stuff, right? But obviously you need to have a mindset where you need to be patient about it, right? Because you have you will have like hundreds of competitors in the same space, right? And obviously you need to have that patience which you know some certain section of founders might not, you know, have that patience or they just want, you know, like quick results and all. So what would be your advice to them and how are you planning to, you know, adopt more AI into, you know, further processes of velocity? So see, I think uh, the approach should not be to build AI uh, products first. The approach should be to solve a customer need gap or a problem leveraging that technology. Right? And I think, uh, as you correctly mentioned, that a lot of companies are being built around AI across the globe. And across a lot of uh, areas, the competition is going to be global, right? So Every use case that you're thinking about, there is someone else who is sitting in Silicon Valley who has potentially raised more money than you, who is building a similar solution, right? And I think the way to uh, address that and build that into your plan is to think your user first, your use case first. So if you have a deep insight about your user, if you have a deep insight about the vertical that you're operating in, that's where differentiated use cases can be built upon. Uh, so instead of building like a thin wrapper on top of an open LLM, uh, it's better for you to sort of Pick the vertical that you understand well. At least in our case, we understand financial services well. Uh, and we therefore understand that typically when a collections agent is calling a particular customer in India, exactly what is the kind of conversation that needs to happen? Exactly what are the boundary conditions that need to be built to ensure that it is compliant regulatory wise, right? And when you go that deep, understanding your user and understanding your vertical specific context better, that's when you can build a differentiated solution. And I think that's what my advice would be to people who are thinking of building AI based applications that they should go deep towards a specific niche customer segment uh, and they should build upon understanding of a vertical that they already know well. Uh, that's where the unique insights and unique use cases are going to come from. And uh, while addressing that problem, they should definitely think about leveraging all the developments which are happening in AI. Uh, but it has to fundamentally be focused on a very sharply defined customer persona. Okay, thank you. And you know, in just a few days back, we had, you know, uh, Chandrasekharan talking about the AI advisory and it's just you know like just jolted the entire segment but he's saying it's not going to affect the startups particularly it's more into the you know like giants tech giants and corporations so what is the to the three of you what is the current sentiments towards this AI advisory in the space so we'll start with that I think we are fortunate enough that uh, a quick advisory came that it is not applicable to startups <laughs> So we are safe uh, because we don't want to run behind uh, someone to take approvals. But I think the logic behind that must be that 
AI can also be misused to create maybe some deep fake videos and deep fake uh, images which may change the sentiment of large amount of population. That might be their intention, but as long as it's not impacting the startup directly, it's good. And it's I think it's very, very difficult to regulate. So they are in a very difficult situation where they have to regulate it to avoid the misuse, but it's so difficult to regulate it that uh, I am sure as of today there might be thousands of startups in India alone who are trying to build some solution. And I don't think government has the tools to, uh, under, to understand and regulate what they are doing. So it will be challenging. But as long as uh, they are clear that it won't impact the startups, they are good. But like the AI startups are you know, content with the fact it's not going to touch us, right? Like there's no 0.1% doubt as well. At least for now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, optimism we want to live in. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely a relief to, to like see the clarification coming in. Uh, and I think uh, the intent of the regulator is to ensure that uh, there is no like systematic uh, misuse of technology. And that's where uh, the focus on big tech comes in from. And I think uh, in general, we have had a regulator which is uh, very much innovation friendly, right? So I think uh, we are definitely optimistic. Uh, we believe that uh, there is enough room for us to like operate, play, experiment, uh, and build something. Uh, and while the initial rumors were a bit concerning, I was glad when the clarification came out. Yeah, just add one more thing to that. Um, again, the the clarification helps, but uh, I am I'm personally, at least I am very uncomfortable with when you give AI autonomy, I mean autonomy over, let's say, a particular product. AI today still is in a state where it's a great tool to increase productivity. If it is assisting humans that you have, uh, be it developers or be it, let's say, let's say for a particular function, if there is somebody doing X, how do you make it by X and X? AI still might not be as mature, even when it comes to Gen AI or LLM models, to, to be given autonomy over a particular product. When you expose it to consumers, that's where it could possibly cause harm. Most startups, to be honest, they are not building their own LLM models. They're using existing models, right? And they all hallucinate. They all go into frenzy. So, so I mean, I think the way for even startups to look at it is like, look, somebody else is building models, I'm using the models. Um, let me just use it for cases when I'm where I'm sure it's not going to hallucinate and just maybe make it a tool for me to become more and more productive. I think I strongly agree uh, with what he's saying. There are some use cases which that does not impact the customer directly. It's it's a tool that may help our internal team to improve efficiencies. I would just like to give a quick example. Um, as an e-commerce company, we need to change products on our homepage every day, and uh, as of today. All the products that we see uh, on the homepage of Bharat Agni are, are completely AI generated. The images of the products are AI generated. Now it's an internal tool that our team figured it out, it used it and has plugged it in our app so that when we want to promote a new product every day, the images are automatically created. Now this does not impact the customer directly. So it need not be regulated. Okay, okay. And this is my last question before we open it to the audience. What Apart from your specific industries, what would be the other industrial sector which can be massively helped with AI? Just one one sector, apart from yours. I think marketing. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I said healthcare before, right? Today we have so much data. I mean, I know every single second, what was your heartbeat, what was your oxygen levels. Um, I have blood reports. Today, no doctor, when they give their diagnosis, they are considering all of that data. And if there is, let's say, a system which had access to that, then I could, I mean, today diagnosis is for symptoms. You have a fever, I'll give you a paracetamol so that your fever goes away. Never is a diagnosis on the root cause of your issue, right? If, you, if I have so much data, then doctors could start giving more accurate diagnosis on the root cause of the issue. And that is, again, another trillion dollar company that would be made in this space because they have so much data, it would be impossible to move on that ecosystem. A bit of you. Uh, I would say one opportunity which is clearly here and now already is uh, to uh, to replace customer service with AI agents. And I think uh, that's going to impact multiple industries. Uh, a lot of customer service is like basic SOP implementation. I think 70-80% of the customer service is basic query resolution like that. 
and that is something that can definitely be done by AI. In fact, uh, I think last month there was an announcement by a fintech company uh, based in Europe called Klarna uh, that they have replaced their customer service agents with AI agents and 70% of the queries are, uh, uh, are handled through that. Uh, they have been able to raise to save some 40-50 million dollars based upon that. Uh, the, the total response time is much faster than human agents. Overall customer satisfaction is much higher. Uh, so it is not something which is going to happen in the next 5-6 years. I think it is here and now already and it is up to the enterprises to adopt it. Thank you so much. And now I will open the entire uh, you know, panel for audience questioning. No questions? Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks so much.